much everyone good evening my name is um, Andrei Kaminsky and together with Willie Ilz and Shai I am co-organizer of this event um, in late 1990s we had this movement that was called agile and this was really a cultural shift for delivery teams air for and for the business for software delivery teams it was a shift from focus on coding and, and to to understanding the business on the other hand for the business business needed to un start understanding the constraints that were introduced by technology. And at the same time, they were needed there to help to prioritize the business value because now this business value was delivered in iterative and in incremental way. Now, both had to collaborate very closely on the way, on the, uh, along the way to deliver the, um, uh, the product. Around 2009, uh, it was coined the term of DevOps. And this was really bringing two opposite sides of the product delivery. The software delivery teams were measured by number of features and thus um, the speed of delivery. On the other hand, we had operations that were driven by stability of production systems, which means limiting, limiting production changes and a um, and number of business features delivered. By bringing them together, we were able to achieve a lot of benefits, among others, like speed was optimized, but primarily the quality was improved. Now, since then, we've got uh, many flavors uh, of DevOps. And primarily the reason for that is that the same philosophy of breaking silos is reused to different functions within organizations. So now today we've got DevSecOps, we've got NoOps, CloudOps, uh, CIOps, FinOps, GitOps, and DataOps. Now, the latter, the latter one is focused primarily on the, the, uh, on the data streams, but I think it's one of the most um, difficult subjects to incorporate in, within DevOps because we've got a lot of um, data structures that are static, we've got the monolithic databases, and ultimately this creates a bottleneck. Now, I'm looking forward to learn more about this, how this could be resolved in the first part. In the second part, we'll hear how GitHub can speed up um, the delivery. So with this, Willie, over to you to introduce our speakers and do housekeeping. Housekeeping. Thanks, Andre. So Andre already mentioned it. Uh, just a reminder, the session is being recorded and will be shared on our Meetup YouTube channel in about a month's time. So please mute your microphones during the presentations, but remember to unmute uh, for the Q&A. Be really interactive. And again, we need your feedback to improve the meetup and your ideas for future sessions. And I am thrilled to introduce Scott Ambler. He is leading the evolution of agile data and agile modeling method, was the co-creator of PMI's disciplined agile uh, toolkit, has co-authored over 20 books, I think, Scott, and helps other authors by reviewing their work um, writing forwards and raise awareness of their books. So Scott, I am honored to pass the virtual stage over to you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna, uh, I'll start sharing. Uh, I guess, Willie, you need to stop sharing first. And there we go. Okay, that messed me up a bit. Um, okay, let's get started here. Oh, uh, the toolbar is always exactly where I don't want it. Um, gotta love Zoom. Okay, hang on. I suppose you're seeing the wrong stuff. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, can you see just one uh, slide? Yes. 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 Okay. That's good. I forgot I had a couple monitors plugged in. Okay. So, anyways, um, so yeah, what I'd like to to talk about today and share with you are some ideas around data DevOps and how does how does uh, database activities and and you know both dev and operational activities fit into the overall uh, DevOps picture. So, anyways, uh, as far as questions go, I'm happy to if anybody's got a burning question uh, just I guess put it in the chat or something and then 
uh, Willie or somebody else, if you could uh, stop me, uh, I can't see the chat right now, uh, and uh, let me know. And I am happy to answer the question on the spot. Um, otherwise, uh, I'll, I'll take questions at the end as well. So I'm going to start by uh, defining what I mean by uh, data DevOps. Um, and then I'll get into uh, both uh, some agile uh, data development techniques as well as some operations techniques. Uh, I'm not going to cover every single possible technique out there because, you know, we've only got an hour, <laughs> but uh, as opposed to a, a day or two. But anyways, uh, and then I'll uh, I'll do a quick wrap up. So, you know, as you heard, uh, I'm, the, I'm the person behind uh, both the agile data and the agile modeling methods uh, from the early 2000s. Um, I have a tendency uh, to take on some of the you know, less sexy topics, uh, for example. So uh, data is ar arguably not the sexiest topic in the world, at least until recently, I guess. Um, but also agile modeling. And uh, uh, I think people forget, you know, if you, if you remember back 20 years ago or 25 years ago, modeling was all about using case tools, um, you know, now called model-based uh, or software-based modeling tools. But um, in these complicated, expensive tools that nobody really understood or or could use. And uh, agile modeling really sort of popularized this idea uh, of um, using whiteboards and post-it notes. And, um, and this is something that was happening in extreme programming and, and, and to lesser extent in, in Scrum at the time, but certainly um, uh, it wasn't very popular in the modeling community. Actually, many of you probably don't realize that Jeff Sutherland uh, used to run a case tool company, um, uh, which is when and he developed Scum, uh, Scrum uh, during that process, uh, during uh, during that time. So anyways, um, it was a different world 20, 25 years ago um, with modeling. And, you know, now today, um, it's the exact opposite. You know, everybody's doing uh, post-it notes and sketches and very few people are using the uh, more sophisticated tooling, um, probably to their detriment. But anyways... Uh, this is not a uh, this is not a modeling talk today, uh, but what it is is a a, a data DevOps talk. So what I'm going to do, as I uh, as I promised, I'm going to start by defining what I mean. So um, data dev or data development is you know all the developments the de development side of databases. So how do you how do you develop and evolve uh, these databases over time, and data ops. Uh, is the operations side of the house. Um, so earlier, I, I think it was Andre, you know, used the term data ops. Um, I'd argue that's incorrect because um, it, it's really uh, data DevOps that we should be talking about these days uh, because data operations has been a term for uh, many decades. Uh, so I would, I, I would argue we should not uh, co-opt it um, just for the uh, sake of a, of a quick term. Uh, so I prefer data uh, da DevOps or argue, uh, perhaps database DevOps. I, I don't like that as much, but because um, there's more to it than just database stuff as I'll um, talk about here. But anyway, so just like DevOps is the streamlining of Dev and Ops, data DevOps is the streamlining of database or data development and data operations stuff. So um, should be no surprise there. Okay, so... Let's take a look at the you know the the classic um, DevOps uh, infinite loop, and uh, let's take a look at it from the point of view of data. So, um, for many years, I've argued that planning and modeling are effectively the same thing. Um, we're thinking things through before we before we act. So, uh, modeling is a is an act of of planning or thinking. Um, and then on the coding side, although there's you know many implementation techniques um, in the data world. Uh, database refactoring is probably the key one um, for doing an agile, you know, for taking an agile approach to uh, data stuff. Uh, it's very likely the key one um, that was missing from traditional uh, database work. And I think you know, earlier, a couple of us were, were talking just before this, this presentation started, and uh, the data folks, the data community have really struggled to um, you know, be effective in the, in the new Agile and, and DevOps world. And it's because of a few missing techniques. Uh, another one would be continuous database integration. And this is you know, the data, you know, as the name implies, the um, database version of this technique. And I've got detailed slides coming up on all of these, uh, all of these techniques as well. But 
Uh, as you'll see, there are a few uh, very important and critical nuances um, to integrating databases. Um, it's not as simple as integrating code. And the fundamental challenge, which we're going to see with all of these techniques, or pretty much all these techniques, is the fact that data is persistent. Uh, and you can't break the data. And there's, you know, there's many things that you, or you don't want to break the data. Um, you can easily break the data. That's the, that's one of the challenges, I guess. But uh, you really don't want to break the data. Um, and as a result, it really hampers uh, a lot of classic agile techniques. And uh, that's the reality on the ground. <laughs> there's nothing you can do about that other than learn how to deal with it. Um, and of course, automated database regression testing. Um, it's interesting that the, up until recently, the data community really hasn't had a, any sort of culture around testing. Um, and still, even today, there are, are not very many testing books for databases. Um, and, you know, pop on Amazon and, and check it out. Not many, um, surprisingly not many. And then you, you do a search for how many Java testing books are, are there out there or C++ books or, you know, any language. Um, and there'll be far more. Um, even new languages, you know, reasonably new languages have been out for, you know, popular for a couple of years. And there'll be often dozens of testing books. Um, and yet we're still sort of struggling with uh, basic database testing material. Um, then, of course, uh, continuous database deployment. Um, also, uh, because of the persistence of data, this is also a unfortunately challenging thing sometimes um, due to just, well, versioning, um, basic versioning of data um, can be a bit of a mess. Um, and then we get into, you know, fundamental operation stuff. So how do we, um, how do we ensure uh, data quality? Um, it's interesting. I'm, I'm doing a lot of work in the AI space right now. And I, one of the big challenges there is data quality. Um, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out. Uh, so, you know, if you hear all these horror stories about biased AIs and, and challenges are around that, it's almost always because of the data. And um, we just haven't invested in data quality. Um, there's uh, most, or, you know, many organizations have some very severe uh, data quality problems, uh, which is why they're struggling with a lot of things. But, um, and they're not, you know, they, they need to be fixing it, uh, which is what database refactoring is all about. But anyways, um, on the operational side of things, uh, as we'll see, uh, there's a lot of issues that we have to uh, take into account to keep our operational data of reasonably high quality. And, or at least to, you know, not let it, uh, not, not, not let our data technical to get, debt get worse. And then on the monitoring side of things, uh, data security is is the interesting game in town um, in that space. Uh, you know, system monitoring is always important and interesting, but it's really the the security stuff that uh, um, keeps people up at night. So uh, let's let's jump into each of these techniques uh, in a little more detail. Uh, I've, I, for each technique, I have one or sometimes two slides uh, describing it. Uh, and these slides uh, are on uh, slideshare.net. A PDF of these slides are on slideshare.net. Uh, I shared the URL in the uh, chat um, just, just as I was starting. So um, you can uh, easily uh, get a hold of them if you want to. Uh, so agile data modeling. Uh, so it's basically just an agile evolutionary collaborative approach to data modeling. Now, the big you know, the big challenge here is the traditional community tends to want to do a lot of modeling up front. Um, and this is still a challenge in the data world, um, often because they don't know how to evolve database schemas. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. But the, the basic idea is if you are, if you have the capability to evolve something easily, then modeling it can stay lightweight. Um, the challenge is, is when you don't know how to evolve something, in this case, a database schema, um, and do so safely and easily, then you've got the challenge that um, if, if you believe it's hard to evolve, then that motivates you to do more upfront thinking and more upfront uh, planning and modeling in this case. Um, so in the, data, in the data modeling space, what we should do is a little bit of initial data modeling, get a, get an understanding of the landscape. So a high level conceptual diagram. So what are the boxes and what are the lines? So what are the main entity types and the relationships between them? I won't get them right. I won't identify all of them, 
but I want to get a, a reasonable handle on the landscape of uh, you know what what I'm dealing with. Um, but then um, throughout construction, uh, you know, so you know, up front during sprint zero or inception or initiation, whatever you want to call that, um, ideation in some cases, um, you do you, you do your upfront high level modeling there. But then the details can come out over time during your construction sprints, or in the case of uh, a, a Kanban or a lean based approach, um, as you're implementing things. Um, and I'll talk a little bit that a little bit about that as well. Um, so the details can come out over time, and this is possible if you have the ability to safely evolve what it is that you're modeling, in this case, databases. So one of the challenges with um, doing a, like a just-in-time approach to data modeling, um, you know, so get, you know, get, you know, modeling the data during the, during sprints or during um, the construction part uh, is the challenge that sometimes your, your data analysis of your, um, of your legacy data sources takes more than a couple of weeks. So you might have a two week sprint, but it's gonna take you eight weeks to do the, the analysis and, and the rest of the work. Um, so the, and, and that's the nature of the beast, right? And it's not, and the, the simplistic agile techniques of, well, let's just break the user stories up into smaller chunks, right? Yeah, it, that's cute. Um, but the fact is, is that even if you've got really small chunks, the data analysis can still be really nasty because you still might have to do the same amount of data analysis, no matter how many little chunks you've broken your, your requirement up into. It's just the nature of the beast. Um, I've worked on systems where on average, it took six to eight weeks to do the detailed data analysis that was required um, in order to understand the data sources to generate the reports or the reporting views um, or the the dashboard screen, screens that were neat that were required. Um, the work it's like the writing of the report was almost trivial. Um, it was understanding the data um, and then doing the work to transform it and clean it up. Um, that's what was that's what was critical, um, and that's where all the work was. And it was way more than a sprint. And there was like no magic we could do, no vertical slicing we could do. We you know we'd already vertical vertical sliced. Um, that's easy. That's a, that's a no brainer. Um, it's this it's this legacy analysis that you've got to do that's brutal. So what happens? So in this diagram here, I'm looking at it from the point of view of sprint number nine. So here we are in sprint number four, or sprint number five, perhaps, and we're planning you know, a couple months out in this case, uh, because it takes, you know, if you look at, um, you know, the, the, the question story in uh, nine for nine B, a question story is the, a data version of a user story. So it's a, uh, a specialization of a, like a, it's a, just a different way to look at user stories. Um, they're specific to, to data warehousing in this case. Um, so to do the you know, story nine B, um, Looks like there's about six weeks of data analysis to do. There's about, uh, it looks like three weeks for 9A and about a week for 9, 9C. So I guess that's a pretty straightforward thing or or something we already have done, done, done the, the data work for. Um, so the point is, is that um, for 9B, if it really, you know, if that estimate's correct, is that we've got six weeks of analysis work to do, we need to start it starting sometime in, in sprint six in order to be able to have it ready in time to implement the rest of it in sprint number nine. Um, now, from a uh, at the back of the deck, I, I don't uh, have the slide here now. Um, I've got the equivalent slide for uh, a lean Kanban based approach, and things are a little bit easier. Uh, because they don't, uh, they're not batching things up in sprints. But, anyways, but they've still got the same fundamental issue of if it's six weeks of look ahead data analysis work, it's six weeks of work. Um, you got to do it at some point. So, anyway, so that's a little bit tough. Um, then the next challenge, or next challenge, I should, shouldn't say challenge, I should say uh, technique is database refactoring. So just like a code refactoring is a straightforward and safe and simple uh, change to the design of your code to improve the quality of it, a database refactoring is a simple change to a database schema that improves its design. Now, I'm being liberal uh, with the definition of a, of a database schema. So this could be structural aspects. So like, you know, things like the, the table structure um, in your database. It could also be code aspects as well. So 
Um, there is code in your databases. There's store procedures, there's functions, there's triggers and good stuff like that. Um, so code refactorings that are applicable to say Java code are also applicable to your PL SQL code. Um, so that's the, that's the reason to be straightforward. Um, the, it's the structural and the code quality refactorings or uh, data quality refactorings, I'm sorry. Uh, they can be a little bit harder, particularly the structural ones like breaking a table up or renaming a column, uh, for example. And I'll show you how to implement a column, um, rename in a second. But the challenge with, uh, with database refactoring and the reason why traditional people are so scared of changing a, a the schema of a production database is one of coupling. You might have a hundred systems or a thousand systems accessing a database, um, so you're afraid of you're afraid of breaking a, you know a thousand systems. So, for example, if I rename a column in the customer table in my in my key customer database, um, I can I'll break every single if I just blindly rename that column, I'll break every single application or if uh, that accesses that column, or if I split the column in two for, for whatever reason, or combine a couple of columns for whatever, or for whatever good design reasons. So about 15 years ago, uh, I wrote a, I co wrote a book called Refactory Databases with Pramosh Sanilej uh, from ThoughtWorks. He's a, a senior, uh, senior executive now at ThoughtWorks, uh, technical executive. And to show how to actually do this safely, uh, and that book was written from the point of view of a production database. I mean, in this case, an or it was Oracle 8 or something. This is how old the book is. But uh, a production database being accessed by over 100 different systems, written on a, in 100 different languages, running on 100 different platforms, um, none of which are under my control. Well, well, one team is under my control. The other 99 teams... Um, I can't affect. So I'm not in a position to say, everybody just rewrite your apps and roll and you know release them all at once. Can't do that. Okay. It, it'd be easy. It'd be easy. It'd be a nightmare, but um, can't do that. Uh, so probably can't do that. So anyways, um, how can you still safely refactor your database schema? So the answer, um, at least for structural refactorings, which is where almost always the challenges are, um, here's the answer. So I'm going to walk through an example of renaming a column. And this is absolutely trivial. But if you were to go to your organizations tomorrow and go to your traditional data people and, and say, I want to rename a column in, I want, you know, we've got this customer table. And one of the columns is called F name. This is where we store the first name of a customer. Well, that's that's a quality problem for us. It's not understandable. For some reason, we need to rename it. I don't know why, but we need to rename it. And I want you to rename this column and release it into production this afternoon. Can you do that? Now, and, and say we're like the Royal Bank of Canada, <laughs> you know, some big, some big bank uh, or some big organization. More than likely, they'd laugh, laugh in your face and they tell you, you know, it's not possible. And this would, this would be a multi-month effort um, in some cases. And this is absolutely trivial. Um, for those of you who are data people, um, this is an altered table statement. This is trivial. If it takes you, you know, if it takes you more than five minutes to hand jam that, uh, I'd be embarrassed. Uh, let alone if you you know use a tool and, and just you know did it the smart way in like twenty seconds. Uh, but anyways, uh, so what do you do? And, and there, so why why are they scared? Well, they know that if if we rename this, just blindly rename this to first name and, and release that into production, I'm going to break all every single application that accesses that table because none of them are expecting first name. And yes, you could have a, you know, you might have some sort of a, an OR mapping layer and good stuff like that, or views. There's a bunch of ways to fake it, but the, at the end of the day, you can't count on every single team, you know, every single app um, accessing, you know, accessing your database through the, through the, uh, through the persistence layer. I've never seen that in practice. And remember, um, we wrote the book from the point of view of hundred different systems running on hundred different platforms. So you're not going to have a share, you know, um, yeah, you can wrap and there's ways you could wrap with web services and that, but you can't count on everybody invoking, um, those web services. The world just does not work that way. Um, so anyways, you don't do it. Like, obviously you don't, don't just blindly rename it. That's foolish. So instead what you do is you, you add the, the, the call name that you want in this case, first name copy the data over into it, put a trigger in place to keep them synchronized. Um, and you announce that you've made this change. So then over time, 
um, the application and you deprecate F name. Um, so for those of you who are Java programmers or you know other languages with deprecation, you know that as soon as something gets deprecated, that's a signal to stop using it and start using the new stuff because eventually the deprecated stuff is going to go away. So you leave the two versions of the schema, in this case, F name and first name, running in parallel. The database is responsible for keeping things in sync because you cannot trust the app teams. You can't do it, right? Not all of them are going to get the message. Not all of them. Not all of them are going to access the thing in the same way. Uh, but at the, but you also need your data group um, needs to track and prod these teams along. So that way, in the next year or so, or month or so, you know, whatever your time frame is for getting things done around your organization, um, they eventually re do in fact rework their code to use the new stuff. In this case, first name and not the old stuff. So eventually, uh, maybe and. Once the deprecation period ends, um, then you knock out F name, you knock out the uh, trigger because you know there's an overhead there, right? Um, so I want to get rid of that, um, and the the refactoring is safely done. So why would you want to rename a column? You know, if if renaming, you know, if column names are your biggest quality problem, frankly, I would call that a win. Uh, but um, the fact is, is that, you know, any structural refactoring, this is the basic implementation strategy. So splitting columns, rena you know, uh, renaming tables, splitting tables, combining tables, um, anything involving the, stru the structure of a table or, or columns, um, this is basically the implementation strategy. Because the database has got, because you can't break the data, right? You cannot break the data, Um you know, it's just bad, um, just bad things happen when you do that. So the database has to be responsible during the period where things are, you know, the, this interim period where things are deprecated. So that's the basic idea. So how do we pull off database refactoring? Well, just like code refactoring or changes to your code, you know, yeah, I check my change in and, I, and, you know, I want to, you know, run my test suite automatically, integrate all that good sort of stuff, right? So what, why is this an issue? So why isn't it just like the same as code? Once again, it's because of the freaking data. Um, you can't break the data. So the challenge is that when I run it, you know, think about it from the point of view of a single test. So part of CDI or part, part of CI is that we rerun it. If we've got tests, we, we, we rerun our, our regression test suite. So a test should put something in a known state, run, and then clean up after and then put things back in, into the original state that I found it in. So that's great, but it assumes that the people, all the coders are putting thing, putting the database into a known state, doing whatever it is that they're doing, and then, uh, and then putting the database back the way they found it, right? Um, because otherwise there's a side effect. And if, my, if I write a test and it has a side effect, that could blow out any other test that runs afterwards, right? So our tests can't have side effects, but we're only human, so we run that risk. So we've got this issue that we need to put the database back in a known state. Now, restoring the database after every single test runs is just horribly inefficient. Um, We've also got the other, you know, maybe we, you know, maybe we we put our test database, in, you know, uh, uh, one strategy is to restore the database or rebuild it every single time we run our test suite. Um, and of course, you don't do that to production, but you could do that to everything else. Uh, that's also slow and expensive. Um, so anyways, this is an issue. Um, so uh, every so often, I want to rebuild my database, at least restore it from a known state. Uh, let alone rebuilding it uh, uh, from scratch, or at least from a, you know, a partially restored state and then uh, rebuilding uh, whatever changes have occurred since the uh, uh, the backup was taken. Um, another challenge, which is, everybody's complained about for years, is database access time. So database testing is slow, uh, just because you know you're you got data going over the wire and transactions and all that sort of stuff. So. The oh, I should have mentioned that too. One way to restore your database and put it back into a known state is to run your test as a transaction and then roll back the transaction. Um, then you've got interleaving of transactions, and you know, that doesn't always work. <laughs> so, but anyways, it's always risky. There's ways around it, but it's risky um, and complicated and slow. Um, other than that, it's awesome. So, 
Um, and oh, and of course, you have the all the stuff takes time. So some people will use database mocks, um, but then you're not really doing database testing anymore, are you? You're doing mock testing. Um, so you might run your mocks, uh, particularly uh, on your lap, you know, on your uh, on your workstations. But at some point in your testing environments. Uh, you've got to run against the real database uh, because you want to see how that database works because some of your tests are going to be like load testing and stress testing and, um, you know, uh, security testing and good stuff like that. You got to run against the real thing. You can't, you know, running against mocks doesn't get the job done in the long run. Um, it's a great interim technique, but it's also a risk. So anyways, um, continuous integration um, in database land is a bit harder uh, than just in code land. Um, and once again, it's always because of uh, database state. Um, the data is persistent and you can't break it. Um, so when it comes to regression testing, um, which is you know where uh, you know the real challenges are for uh, CI is at least on the database end of things. Um, the point I'm making here is that uh, I like to look at things um, from the point of view of clear box testing. Um, testing the stuff internal in the database, as well as black box testing. The vast majority of uh, database testing, um, and even when I do it, is almost always black box testing. Stick some data in, let it, you know, let, let the database crunch the numbers, do whatever it is that it's doing, and then pull the database out, pull the data back out, see what you got. You know, do, do you have expected results? Um, and this is where all the all the um, challenges around time and and uh, you know, the time it takes is, you know, uh, database access is slow. Um, so anyways, um, how does this affect uh, continuous deployment? Um, so the challenge is that, so say we're on a team, say, say we're on my, you know, so my team, which is one of 100 teams in this organization, uh, my team has six developers on it. Each of us has our own workstation, our own laptop, uh, so we have a, de a development copy of a database. We may or may not be mocking stuff. You know, that'll depend on the developer. Um, but let's assume we've all got, you know, some version of, of a test of a small test database, just enough to run smoke tests on our laptops. Um, so we, it's the same old thing, right? So we're coding away. We, we're implementing stuff, some, you know, normal code, some data stuff. Um, we check in, you know, we check it in. And then, you know, CI kicks in. If the you know if the test suite runs fine on my machine, everything gets automatically pushed up to my first my you know team integration sandbox. CI kicks back in again, same old stuff, right? So and we just keep promoting up the food chain until finally uh, we promote into production. So the challenge is that well, wait a minute, and oh, and then of course there's 100 teams, right? So there's one production customer database. But there could be several integration layers, depending on how sophisticated your testing is. But if there's 100 different teams, there might be 100 different team integration sandboxes. Each, each team has its own uh, database because we want to do whatever it is that we're doing, right? Um, so we want to test in our own environment, make sure we haven't screwed, you know, make, make sure what we've done works. So the challenge is, is that my team is making changes to the database. Your team is making changes to the database, and there's the opportunity for collisions, of course, just like with code, right? Um, so this, so if you've ever worked on a shared, uh, you know, on a shared code base across many, many teams, it's the same sort of issues, right? You, you, there's potential for collisions between the teams, or and between developers, obviously, or individuals, let alone teams. Um, so we have this now we can so think it through right so it's bad enough with code well it's way worse with data it's always worse with data <laughs> that's just the way it is so what happens is now the databases need to know the versions their version numbers right so then when my team makes a change to our version of the database we get you know we ping uh, production or we ping something that gives us a version number um, or we could do it simple date time checks and all, you know, the date time stamps. And all that stuff. So anyways, um, the point is, is that each of the, the versions of the databases at all these levels need to know their own versions. So that and need to know the changes that got them to that version. So that way, as we promote up the food chain, 
we can start applying the change the changes the change scripts or how it is you're implementing them probably a single script for each change um because you want to have a simple change right um and you promote the change scripts up and then they get integrated further you know it, closer and closer you get to production with the greater chance uh as you're getting closer to production of a collision right and then when there's a collision you, you know you, you you push an error back down the food chain and you let people um and the, the, the people figure it out so not only do we have version source code we also have versioned databases and the versioning it just like the versioning is you know, of a of a file is you know, based on a check-in, based on a change since the last, you know, whatever the last version was. Same sort of idea with databases, but the databases themselves need to know their version numbers uh, or need to know their version IDs. It doesn't have to be a number. It has just, uh, some sort of unique ID or, that you can distinguish between um, instances of the databases. So the point is, is that continuous deployment also becomes a little more complicated um because the it basically your cd your cd scripts have to ping the database and figure hey you know are you happy <laughs> you know what version are you, are you happy um okay fine i can promote or oh no you're not happy okay okay push the error back down so that's basically what's going on um, so a little you know not too bad but a little bit of a complication for cd as well okay so now let's get on to the arguably the ops side of things so the so database refactoring is a data quality technique um on the dev side of the house and, and, and arguably you know regression testing is as well um but why, when a database is operational we also have potential quality issues right um people could be sticking bad trying to stick bad data um into an app which then goes into the database uh we could have um data coming in from social media you know big data type stuff and uh just you know garbage data <laughs> when it gets down to it uh for the most part um then we have uh privacy issues we have uh you know how do we how do we clean up uh, incoming poor quality data right so um we can transform it that's part of the etl um extract transform uh load in uh, data warehousing so um, we can do transformations of the data as it's coming in. We can mask the data as it's coming in to uh, mask out poor uh, quality data or um, you know, uh, some aspects of transformation as well. Um, and then there's all the basic database operation stuff that's you know usual stuff, like how do we back up and restore databases? Um, are we keeping track of data lineage? Um, so when a piece of you know, many regulations, um, and particularly now, if you're, I, I think it's Bill C-27, uh, the new Data Privacy Act that's uh, in Parliament right now, I mean, you know, for those of you who are, who are here in Canada, um, there's going to be some very interesting privacy um, regulations coming in soon, including, including some for data quality and data privacy and, and AI, um, and data, lineaging, data, uh, data lineage is going to be absolutely critical in that and what data lineage is is basically where does the data come from uh, so if you've got a, a piece of incoming data from whatever source is coming in what do you do to that data uh, you know as it gets into your systems into you know wherever it is you you your staging areas are into your data warehouses data marts you know wherever the data is going going you've got all this traceability and all this lineage because the regulations say you've got to be able to you know many regulations will say basically say along the lines of you got to know where it came from and you got to know what you did with it and how it's how it's been affected um you know particularly with financial data as well as uh, uh any personal private uh what data that should be private um keeping track of data history changes um and all this sort of stuff so anyways there's a lot of um ongoing data quality um, issues and techniques that you can apply uh, as part of your operational database operations uh, activities. And of course, you know, big data uh, is uh, problematic. Uh, there's just more data coming in faster every single day. So get used to that. Uh, it's just going to get worse. So, and then of course, data security. Uh, so there's always bad people, you know, there's always bad actors out there uh so you know most of uh, a lot of it security or inf infosec is around uh, protect need data so i just want to do a call out for that um don't underestimate that and um, as i said earlier 
there are some very significant uh, data privacy regulations coming in in Canada. This is also true in the United States. Uh, the Europeans, while well, they already have GDPR, um, but they're also working on AI oriented regulations as well. Um, so I suspect it will be implemented as a an update or an addendum to GDPR, but we'll have to see how that plays out. But anyways, um, European countries have, uh, are uh, going further uh, with their data privacy and uh, you know, data laws. So all, all good stuff. And, and you know, Australia is doing the same thing. Many other countries are as well. But, um, you know, the, you know, the Canada, the US and Europe are, are what I focus on. And so anyways, a um, lot of stuff coming our way. Um, it's going to be pretty rough, um, you know, particularly oh, California as well, in the United States, they tend to lead the way in uh, regulatory stuff down there. But um, a lot of interesting things are happening in that space, which is going to have a huge impact on uh, everybody. Oh, I should also mention uh, secure deletion. Uh, this is something I don't hear a lot of pe enough people talking about. So basically, um, how do you delete secure? Uh, how do you delete data? Um, can you do it securely and uh, and provably? Uh, and it's not just a simple it's something as simple as erasing data. Uh, you just you know doing a, a delete command um, in SQL, for example. Um, I wish it was, but you know people can copy data. You know any piece of data is going to get stored in multiple locations in your systems. Um, and if you've got to actually delete something, um, there's a one of the rights uh, that you know one of the data rights, the privacy rights that people have or will have, depending on the on where your country is uh, with this, is the right to be forgotten. And uh, argue, you know, there's limits on you know um, on that, but for you know not for you know non-critical firms, um, then you know, so say it's a bank. Um, you can ask to be forgotten um, that, you know, you know, never, you know, or, um, you know, never remember, you know, just a demand that you forget that uh, you ever contact, you know, we ever had any contact. Um, now, obviously, the other regulations uh, kick in there, too. But um, you can't, you know, there's some situations where you can't and some forms of data that you can have, you can require a company uh, delete and provably and securely delete. Uh, so anyway, so there's some interesting, um, interesting stuff happening there. Um, so that's just gonna get more complicated as well. So just to wrap up before I, I go to questions, um, and if you if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, and I see I, I see that some the some people have been chatting. Uh, so some parting thoughts. So the increasing pace of change and complexity, the volume we're dealing with. Um, demands nothing less than complete data agility. I, I think this is one of the reasons why um, we're finally seeing the data community start to come up to speed on, on agility, on DevOps. Um, they're stuck. <laughs> they, they're, you know, in many cases, they're overwhelmed, um, significant data quality debt or technical debt, data technical debt. Um, in many of these organizations, and um, the demands for data um, are increasing. Um, you know, the, particularly the increasing uh, complexity of business and the, you know, all the VUCA stuff um, motivates uh, to have more data you know, or better quality data faster um, to make better decisions. So uh, we need to adopt these techniques and more. Like I said, this is the um, just some key techniques. It's not all of the possible techniques um, out there. Um, so anyway, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to, to take some questions, um, assu assuming we've got time. So how do we want to go about questions? Scott, there's a few in the chat. Let me find the first one. Okay. It's from Michael Sue, uh, humbly requesting any more reading resources for doing schema migration, expanding on more cases than just renaming a column, renaming tables, etc. Yeah, so so the refactoring database book has um, 65 uh, refactorings in it um, with full source code. So to implement it, because um, in order to implement a refactoring, there's the initial um, potentially, depending on the type of refactoring, of course, there's the initial work of just like, you know, changing the schema, 
Um, so there's scripts to do, you know, there's, so we wrote um, source code examples to write those initial scripts. There's also the, um, in the case of rename column and many others, uh, a trigger needs to be written to uh, keep the two columns in sync um, and the, the two versions of the scheme in sync and the data um, in the two versions of the scheme in sync. And then, um, you know, simple scripts to drop the trigger and to drop the column um, at some point in the future. So, so we uh, throughout the book, we, we wrote it from the point of view of Oracle 8, um, which is the latest version of the time. The not a, we didn't use any special features of Oracle. So there's like no magic involved at all. Uh, we wrote a few examples in uh, MySQL at the time, um, just to show that, you know, here, you know, here's the Oracle code, here's the MySQL version of the code, because um, it's different languages, right? So, um, you know, here's here's the two two environments just, just to show it could be done. Now, there's tools. You know, so the, remember, this was 15 years ago, right? So there's tools today that implement a lot of the refactorings um, uh, from, uh, uh, yeah, from Redgate. There's some open source stuff, but I'm um, from Redgate and, and uh, many others. But um, yeah, so if you can type in code from a book, they're there. Um, and, the, and the database refactoring site that Promote, I, I think, still maintains um, has samples of code as well. But the book, it, it's a reference book. It's a thick book, and it's mostly, there's a lot of code um, just to show it can be done. Because the challenge we had was, uh, way back then, um, I wrote a book called uh, about 20 years ago called Agile Database Techniques, where I had a chapter on database refactoring, which I thought was enough. And then the the data community flipped their lids. They said, this isn't possible, can't be done, blah, blah, blah. You're lying, agile guys, evil bastards, you. And so my response was, well, shut your yaps. Um, here's how you do it, right? So we said, okay, so um, Promotal, I decided that, you know what, let's take the mystery out of this. Um, let's just shut this conversation down by saying, by giving the code. And, and our entire response was, here's the code. If you can type in code, and it's not complicated code, right? It's like, it's usually got, you know, 10, 15 lines. Um, if you can, if you have the magical ability to type in code from a book, you can do this too. I mean, it just shut the entire conversation down. It was awesome. Um, but it, it's, uh, but yeah, so anyways, if you, code's there, if you want to, you know, example, and, and converting it over to an, another, Another database is dirt simple. Um, you know, since we wrote the book, I've done I've done this in IMS, uh, like a you know a network hierarchical. I guess it's higher. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a hierarchical uh, database. Um, ancient technology. <laughs> it's a ancient technology, let alone something new. Um, so, anyways, a lot of good stuff out there. So let me find you the next one. Uh, that's from Dinesh. Do you recommend one version ID for the entire database or separate version IDs for schema, metadata, code? Um, I keep things as simple as possible. I um, back in the day, what I used to, when we when we wrote the book, um, we used to have the production, you know, the source production database itself. Um, we just, I would just, I used to just put a, a trigger, uh, not a trigger, a, st a stored uh, procedure in there. So I just ping the day, but he'll give me a new version, um, you know, and then that way, uh, give me a new ID basically. Um, and then um, it would come back. So then that way, um, because you, you, the short answer is you need to have a strategy that's guaranteed to give you unique IDs. Um, the date timestamps um, pretty much get that job done. Although you do, in theory, you've got the risk that, you know, two versions of, you know, my my instance of the database and your instance of the database, uh, we ping them at the exact same time and they hand back the exact same date time, date time stamp. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, chances of that happening are almost nil, but not quite, not quite. In the next one, it's from Doug. I don't think I'm technical enough technical enough to ask about data lineage, but would be curious if there were any extra comments on best practices or additional educational sources about tracking movement and transformation of data across environments. Oh, yeah, um, great, um, great question. So um, there's a, a, a data warehousing methodology called Data Vault. Uh, well, Data Vault 2, to be accurate. Um, and they have nailed this problem. 
Um, so Data Vault 2 is described as a collection of uh, pattern design patterns for the most part. Um, also some architecture patterns as well, but mostly design patterns. And they deal um, uh, just perfectly uh, with this and, and many other critical issues like um, history and uh, keys, um, uh, you know, key assignments. And uh, now, and now it's oriented towards, towards data warehousing, but data warehousing is where all these issues pop up. Um, and the nice thing about Data Vault 2 is it's implemented at scale with just horrendous uh, scaling issues, um, which they've nailed. Uh, so it, it's really sort of interesting. But yeah, they've uh, they've got a lot of great advice for um, data lineaging, data, data history, data lineage, um, because when you're in the data warehousing space, um, you you're going and, and it's international, so it's, they're going to get hit with regulations just across the board. Uh, so you got to do what you got to do, right? So. They've dealt with that. So yeah, take a look at Data Vault too. That's great. Thanks so much. I'll look into that. Oh, there's actually quite a few more questions here. Uh, hopefully we can cover a couple more. Yeah. Uh, the, the next question is from Blaine. For simple applications, we insert the list of values for code tablets. Uh, for code tables by means of uh, SQL scripts that are executed after the DDL for the code tables are run. Do you feel this is a reasonable approach? Yeah, so I, I've basically done done that sort of thing myself or I it's even barbaric and I dropped the, um, I didn't even use a table, I just dropped dropped uh, uh, code uh, you know, uh, code, code script, SQL scripts into uh, into single file, you know, one file per script and into a folder. So with the, with the name of the script, like the the name the, the ID number, um, sort of barbaric, but it got the job done. But yeah, so but keep yeah, uh, but very quickly, put, you know, putting them in a table, you know, putting them in tables and having the uh, the databases um, store uh, each individual change script, um, and sometimes scripts um, for a single change, right? Because you've got um, there'll be. Um, uh, schema altering, like a, a, a script to alter the the structure, but there'll also be a, a script to um, change the data to transform the data. Um, now, actually, you know, one of the things I, I didn't mention, <laughs> um, and I should have, uh, one of the challenges with some of the data quality, um, and even and even a couple of the structural uh, database refactorings, are there one way streets. Um, so you should, in theory, it'd be, you should be able to back out of a change and yeah, you can back up and restore databases. So you can always brute force it if you have to, um, but good luck. Uh, so anyways, um, but the problem is, is, is some of them are, are, are not reversible, not easily reversible. Um, yeah. Because, so for example, if I combine three columns into one, um, I might also be changing the data values to get it to, to conform to the semantics. Uh, and this is another another challenge, a huge challenge in, in organizations. So earlier I was talking about you know, one database with 100 teams working on it. Well, a serious implication of that is those 100 teams probably have different semantics um, for the data. And then, so which is one of the reasons why the data folk want to go off and model the heck out of everything be and then tell the development teams here's what you're going to do like it or you know suck it up buttercup this is what you're doing and that doesn't work because then the, the developers just ignore them right so but the problem is is that reality on the ground is that 100 at 100 teams some of them are going to have different semantics for the data so here's here's an example um so say we have an ice cream flavor table Right, so we, you know, so my team is dealing with selling simple ice cream cones, and we sell chocolate, strawberry, and vanilla. That's it, that's it, right? So we have three, three flavors. That's our data semantics. Your team, you're a little more sophisticated. You've got seven different flavors of chocolate, none of which are called chocolate. You've got like mocha fudge and fudge orama and fudgy chocolatey fudgy fudge, um, you know, death by chocolate like seven different flavors of chocolate, but none of them are chocolate. So now what do we do, right? And if we have to combine that table, if we have to combine that data into a report, um, we've got, it sounds simple, but there's different semantics there, right? Um, and because your team who is very sophisticated when it comes to chocolate, 
um, you're not going to want to be even associated with my barbaric single chocolate flavor, right? Because, you know, ooh, bad. Um, so and so that's, that's a simple and trivial thing, but this is what's going on. And we might, and I might not know about your team, you might not know about my team, and yet we're still using the same database. And we don't find out about this chocolate collision. Um, and, and it's not a structural collision, right? We're still using, you know, we're still using the same flavor table, um, but we've got, but we're, we've got different values and the values have different semantics and we're, and that's not easily uh, findable except through tests, but my tests are never going to look for chocolatey fudgy fudge ram or whatever it was, and you're not going to look for chocolate. So this is very difficult to find um, and detect, um, which is one of the reasons why we have so much data, data, uh, technical data, and as just a simple and trivial example. Um, but if there's flavor regulations, uh, it could be a, you know, that could be a finable offense. I don't know. Um, so it's an issue. So, yeah. Um, so, and so this is, so the point is that the data, data stuff just brings a bunch of really weird and unexpected issues, like weird from a developer point of view that you're probably not thinking about. And it gets really, and, it, and with, it, when it's like one app team using one database, that's trivial, you know, who cares, right? That's simple. It's when you've got shared data, which is the norm in organizations, um, that's when it starts to fall apart. And, and, and agile, agile techniques tend to exasperate those problems, um, usually. Not always, but usually. Sorry, may I just squeeze in another question here? You bet. Um, yeah, long winded answer. This is a really interesting one from Jason. Uh, with these potential regulatory requirements coming in around data, what do you think the pressure will, will be to implement data DevOps techniques for those companies that haven't already? Um, I think it's going to be huge, right? Like um, testing. Um, so many organizations do, do not have their act together in database testing. In some cases, they haven't even thought about it. Um, like, you know, you'll ask them, you know, you know you'll, you'll get the, I'll go into an organization and the data guys will be whack, you know, want, 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 want about data quality. Um, and then usually my first question on my mouth is, oh, cool. Um, you know, show me your database, you know, show me your regression test suite for your database. And it'll be like deer caught in headlights. They might not even have even thought about it. So how dare you talk about quality when you're not talking about testing as well, right? How dare you? Um, but this is a cultural challenge. And so anyway, so yeah, so I think like, not that testing is going to solve all the problems, but it's certainly going to solve some of your, some of your quality problems. I mean, it certainly can, if you do it right, it's going to solve some of the semantic issues as well, right? Having a, having a test suite that's appropriate to database to enforce the semantics expected at the database level is critical. Plus like quality checks and masking and a bunch of other things too, um, to, to, to address operational quality issues or to hopefully uh, address quality issues. Um, so that's going to be critical. So I think, uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, opportunity because, uh, you know, if you look at the, the success rates of AI projects right now, it's horrendous. It's like 10 or 15%. Um, most of them are, are failures, almost always, well, sometimes they just don't know what they're doing, but uh, it's almost always because of data quality problems. Um, they just don't have the data, they can't train the models, um, you know, a bunch of reasons, but uh, it almost always gets back to poor quality data. So you better solve that. And, um, you know, it, all, all those techniques are, are there if you choose to, because in the old techniques of like data steward, like data stewardship is part of the part of the solution but it's not the full solution um and up you know upfront all this detail upfront modeling does not get the job done um like fundamentally um the traditional data quality techniques have have provably not gotten the job done that's why we've got the data quality problems we've got right just i'll i'll i'll, I'll let the you know i'll let the the situation speak for itself um, so we need to do better. And that's almost always means working, working smarter, way more um, automation um, than, than what is currently the norm in most shops when it comes to database stuff. Um, so yeah, automate, automate, automate. And test, test, test. And test, test, test. Auto, uh, yeah, you know, automatically test. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and a lot of database testing when you when you do 
the really sad thing is when you do find organizations that do have a, a, a some sort of database testing strategy, it's almost always manual, which is better than nothing. It's better than nothing. So, you know, step in the right direction, but uh, there's still more steps to go, right? Thank you very much, uh, Scott, for patiently taking the time to answer our questions. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like uh, we are over time. Sorry about so that. On to you, Billy. Um, no, don't be sorry, Scott. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for for sharing your your passion and insight into agile data and modeling. Always great to listen to you. Thank you very much. Great thank presentation. You. Thank you. Mm. All right, next up, uh, uh, we're excited to welcome Michael Kaufmann all the way from Spain. Um, Mike believes that developers and engineers can be happy, or well, we all are, and productive at work. Uh, he loves DevOps, GitHub, Azure, and modern work, and shares his knowledge in books, trainings, and as a frequent speaker at international conferences. Mike, thank you very much for joining us this early in the morning and the virtual stage is all yours. Okay, let me share. Always the Zoom bars everywhere on the screen. So now I have it. Well, hello, um, good evening, Vancouver, um, from the middle of the night here in Spain. Uh, thanks for having me and a special thanks to Willy for also giving me the idea for the talk. So he did the review and asked me, hey, don't you want to share the story behind the book, what you learned? And uh, man, I thought this, this is a really good idea. Uh, this is actually my second book. I wrote a, a book uh, for Wiley's first. Uh, it's about Git. It's more a basic book for, I would not say beginners, but it's a, a very basic book. And it's in German. And uh, I started it one and a half years before the pandemic. And I did not do anything for one year. And then I wrote it in the pandemic and the lockdown in half a year. It was very chaotic. So uh, when I finished it, I was like, okay, I, I'm done. I, I don't expect to write a, a second book uh, soon. So. Um, when I was approached by an editor from Pact that said, hey, don't you want to write a book about DevOps? I was like, nah, I don't know. Uh, first of all, writing again a book. I just finished one. I don't want to write another one. And secondly, a book about DevOps. I don't know. So there are so many books out there. There are good books, right? There, there, there's Accelerate. There's the DevOps Handbook. Uh, release it. There are a lot of books. I, I don't know if we need another book about DevOps. Because I think it's not the, the problem to explain people what DevOps is. I think people have more problems implementing it practically. Um, but I had the good idea, hey, I could write a book about GitHub. Um, GitHub had back then 40 million developers and there's no book out there. Uh, sorry, there was no book out there. I think there was one very basic uh, about only source control and then there was one about actions, but not really a book about GitHub as a DevOps platform. Um, I saw a good opportunity here with a lot of companies adopting it and said, hey, let's write a book about GitHub. Um, I think, yeah, Microsoft bought it. It has a good future. A lot of people adopting it. Um, I, I see value there. And my editor was like, yeah, really, GitHub? It's, uh, it's just a source control. Why, why do you want to write about GitHub? Is there really a market for this? And uh, it took me some while to explain him, no, no, it's Microsoft and it, it's more than just source control. It's also now with actions, CICD, it's a complete DevOps suit, you can do it. And it took me some while to convince him, but I finally did it and I said, okay, go and, and, and write uh, an, an abstract, write an outline for it. So I went back and uh, like normally, right, you, you, you think, okay, how can I write about GitHub? So you start with, okay, these are the hosting options. Uh, this is pricing, this is how you set it up, this is how you get started, these are the different features, we have the source control, planning, CI, CD, uh, very much a little bit aligned to, I think, the documentation. And uh, yeah, I came back with the outline and it looked more or less like this. I had a very, very big outline and uh, most of it was introduction. And the introduction was, okay, why do you do it? Um, how do you measure what you're doing? And, and what are the DevOps metrics? And, and the, the whole why behind it was in an introduction, it was like 200 pages. So this is an exaggeration here with the 70%, but it was a really big introduction. And uh, yeah, the editor was like, 
like nobody wants to read a 200 page introduction i was like yes yeah you are completely right and uh, this made me go back and rethink okay what's the story i, I really want to tell i, I don't want to be a, a github documentation and this is not the the, the mere part so the, the the big part i'm interested in is the the, the, the introduction more or less the the why are you doing it and uh what, what is the story behind it that i want to tell so uh telling a story is hard but finding the story you really want to tell i think is even harder and i mean for my first book it was just about git right it's it's a very basic so the story is quite easy you ju just have to think okay how can i teach people to learn it um but in a more advanced books you you have to tell yourself okay what what do i want to uh tell or what do i want to achieve it's, uh, besides just documenting it and um if i look at books like uh, accelerate or in general the, the, the devops theory it's easy, right? So um, I also had a customer call last year with a German uh, institution, and they were like, explain to me DevOps. Started explaining, and they were like, oh, what's the theory? This is easy. We know this. Uh, the, tell us what, what, what is DevOps in our case, right? So problem is if people start practicing it, and uh, yeah, theory meets practice, and then they have a lot of obstacles, and uh, then, then the problems begin. And so um i like to compare devops with kite surfing so if you're at the beach and you see people kite surf it really looks easy right so they're gliding over the water smooth they are jumping it really looks easy so not a lot of effort and then if you try it you're, you're on your own uh, you find it's really difficult right? yeah, you have a lot of moving parts here so it's it's not just about, about kite control it's also the wind changes direction, it changes in strength, it has gusts, the water moves, uh, it had, you have bigger waves, lower waves, the tide, other kiters. So a lot of uh, things that are moving and are constants, and this makes it really hard to practice individual things. And then it's also a sport, right? And, and you cannot just learn it theoretical by reading a book. Uh, you have to practice it and uh, you have to practice your individual muscle memory and train it and uh, I mean, in kite surfing, if you don't learn it with an instructor, it's it's really dangerous, right? You can hurt yourself, you can other people in in uh, at the beach. So uh, you really need someone that helps you, that guides you, and helps you to bring the theory um, or to, to to practice the theory um, uh, to 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 yeah to to bake it into your your system, and uh, so that you can react and you know how to react at any time. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's also the story I want to help people um, learn uh, in my book. I want to tell them, okay, how can you or how how would a teacher here, kind teacher, teach you to learn this? And I want, okay, how do do we, for example, work with customers that want to implement DevOps or want to want to uh, enhance in their DevOps practices? How how would I um, coach them? Or how would I guide them to learn it uh, to, to building the muscle memory uh, to do the right things and not just explaining the uh, the pure theory, right? So um, it's more about, okay, how do we do it? How do we do it practically? And, and why are we doing it? So the theory behind it. And yeah, so so the, this notion led me to, to the complete new structure of the book. So, so this is now the final final outline. Uh, so it's it's uh, six parts. So I, I had to split some parts up because because of the sizing, and uh, the book consists of six pillars. Right? It's uh, part one: lean management and collaboration. Part two: engineering DevOps practices. Part three: we live with confidence. Part four: software architecture. Part five: lean product management. And part six: GitHub for your enterprise. And um, and we dig a little bit deeper so this is more or less how i would you know, work with customers in like a fast track project or some uh, fast track project or something so uh, first thing you go to the customer and uh, um, so this part one go through it first you go to the customer and you look at the metrics that the customer is measuring so what kpis do they already have because all the kpis they influence how people work and if they don't have flow metrics yet, you will uh, just just measure how people are performing, how, how often they are deploying, um, uh, yeah, yeah, lead time, the, the daily deployment, failure, change failure rate, and so on. So you measure all the DevOps metrics and and some more. You might uh, so so 
that you can later um, have a data-driven transformation, that you see that all the changes you apply have an effect uh, and, and, and are efficient. Um, so this is the first chapter, right? So this sets up basically the transformation. And uh, then you would normally pick individual uh, pilot teams, one or two teams, and then bring them to a new platform or at least to a new way of working. So this is then like the, the lean, lean management part, right? So, so we get them over. And the first thing we do is we change the way how the teams work. So we look at the Kanban, how do we track uh, work, uh, how is uh, work scattered, work is work. So let us organize everything in one backlog in one place and, and not have people uh, scattered their, their different agendas and different uh, boards or backlogs or something. So this is chapter two, then plan, track, visualize work. And then and, and here get very practical already. Okay, how can you do this with GitHub issues, with GitHub uh, projects? Uh, and what are the things people have to be aware of, right? Limiting work in, work in progress, um, um, yes, uh, um, yeah, sizing down work into small parts and then this kind of thing. Um, chapter three then is, is teamwork and, and collaborative uh, development where we explain how you can collaborate on code on changes and, and how you can also batch down your work, not, not just from the work perspective, but then also from, from the delivery part and, and how you uh, work with pull requests together and do suggestions and uh, yeah, the branching strategies. Um, and chapter four <clears throat> is um, um, about uh, asynchronous work and collaborate from anywhere. And uh, I think especially with, um, with Corona, more, more and more companies are going to remote work. And uh, this has a lot of benefits for a lot of developers, but it has also a lot of challenges. So um, if you can master it, I think you have a lot of possibilities as a company. But it's also challenging to, to get, uh, especially from the team building um, aspects. And uh, if you have multiple time zones, like now, so one has to get up early. So you have to look, okay, how do we spend our teams around the globe to work effectively, asynchronously together? And um, yeah, chapter five. Um, uh, was also a little bit complicated, people that didn't really get it and why it's here in the lean management part. Uh, chapter five talks about the influence of open and, and inner source on software delivery performance. Um, and uh, I think this comes down to um, a lot of companies um, now want to, so every, every software, comp every company becomes a software company, right? And uh, all the companies want to hire developers to work on their core products, but they don't, they don't have enough uh, developers. So they, you really have to, to look, okay, what is really our core software? What was, brings really value to our product? And what's our, what are just tools around it? And the tools you can outsource. You don't want to inner source them. Uh, you, you can have other people do it because uh, you want to focus your developers on your core product. And also I think this is also an opportunity for open source and open source is anywhere, uh, everywhere around your product, right? In the tooling and the base dependencies and everything. So um, it's important how you as a company uh, engage with open source and it should be part of your strategy and you should strategize this. Okay, what do we insource? What do we outsource? And how do we ensure that also this open source is funded with, for example, GitHub sponsors so that they can keep on uh, providing features, maintaining the platform we depend on. Um, yeah, so this was the first part about lead management. And um, yeah, so um, every chapter always has a, a case study uh, where I try to explain, okay, how would you do this in, in a practical environment, right? So, okay. First thing, we measure everything. Then we take the pilot teams and then we bring one pilot team, or the second one um, on the new platform. And first we start with the work, with the lean management, how people collaborate. And uh, then in the second part, we would now add uh, DevOps engineering practices on top of them. Moment, I just opened the chat. Um, yeah, so um, when you, um, yeah, first thing, right, look about the lean management, how people work together. 
And now if they're in the new platform, we want to start adding DevOps practices. And I think the most important one is automation um, or, or CI CD practices. Um, so there's also very practical chapters here around uh, GitHub Actions, how to get started um, um, and uh, yeah, how to use Actions, not only for CI CD, but also for any kind of automation in GitHub. Um, and uh, yeah, chapter seven is about how to run your workflow. So this is something I just had to split up in two chapters, right? So this is more or less the, the, the part where, okay, you're on the new platform, uh, let's try to um, automate your build, your CI CD and get to release everything and at least here continuous integration. Um, then chapter eight is about managing uh, your dependencies with GitHub packages. So also something I see a lot of um, uh, customers struggling with that they still have binaries, especially if they come from another source control version and not yet on Git, then they still uh, put binary somewhere in the source control and, and moving to packages also helps in the, helps in the transition uh, to the new platform. And then chapter nine is uh, about CD, not, not CI, is uh, deployed to any platform with some hands on, okay, how do you deploy to cloud providers? Um, um, how do you do stage deployments and uh, ring-based deployments and so on. And um, chapter 10 then is about uh, feature flags. I think this is still uh, one of the most important um, yeah, capabilities for, for DevOps teams uh, to release frequently is to work with feature flags. And if you do it, it comes with a lot of benefits. So I need people to understand what, what feature flags are before we then talk about trunk-based development and really the actual uh, yeah, Git branching workflow uh, people uh, can use to effectively collaborate. And this then ties back to the, to the lean management approach, right? How people should work in small batches and can effectively collaborate on, on changes. Um, so this was the, the second part is then, right? First, lean management. The second part is, okay, we start with the simple DevOps practices to get started. A lot of customers already have this, or it's just uh, looking if they do it the right way. And uh, then the part three is like leveling up, okay? Uh, release with confidence, uh, shift left testing, uh, shift right testing, chaos engineering, how to manage your, your test portfolio, um, how to deal with flaky tests and then like everything, okay, now we have it automated. No, 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 it's increase uh, the level and, and add more and more um, yeah, quality measures um, here to your pipeline to, um, yeah, to 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 faster so to, to reduce also time um, in your release pipeline right shifting left um, more to the developers or shifting right to production to reduce uh, the, the time your release pipeline takes um yeah and also this the security part i had to split it in three chapters so it's like uh, 13 14 and 15 shifting left security uh, with uh, github advanced security so it's, it's a big topic here um doing the software composition analysis with dependent board code scanning secret scanning and also a lot of uh, general advice here red team blue team uh, exercises and how you can like like bake uh, security really into your process so that's like 13 14 is just about securing your code uh, with the dependencies and uh, chapter 15 um, or the overall story securing your deployments uh, for, with end-to-end -end monitoring um, S bombs uh, and uh, yeah, security information and event management. So, so uh, this is like the the leveling up then uh, the entire uh, second and then the third part. Um, part four is then about software architecture because if you look at, uh, at the, the research right software architecture also affects very um, massively how people work. And if you're on the, in the DevOps metrics and in the top quartile or in the low quartile, um, but it's always a hard topic to start with, in my opinion, right? So if you start with the, with the new teams and working them and want to start with DevOps practices, then, then you probably not want to start with the software architecture, but later it's an important part to have a look at. So, and uh, of course, uh, microservices, not microservices, we want more monolith, when it is good, when is it effective? And of course, this is a little bit theoretically because the architecture then really depends on your environment and on your coding languages and everything. So it's more a theoretical part. So uh, I focus more here on uh, um, 
Yeah. So the, 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 the influence of your team structure on uh, the software quality. So the, the, the reverse Conway maneuver, right? So, so how do you, or, or if you look at your structure now, how people are in your software architecture, then it's always connected to each other. So how do we have to um, align the teams and, and structure the teams to have a good software architecture? Because this is like a two-way uh, connection. So, right. Uh, um, I, I had a customer uh, in Norway and I visited them and we asked, okay, what's your software architecture? And they were like, yeah, it's a spaghetti design that they called it like this. And, and they had the same. So yeah, how is your team? Yeah, no, we don't have a team. So we have a lot of consultants that come to us and then we do changes to the code base and uh, it really good, really see <laughs> they, they draw it and it looked like a spaghetti uh, code, right? And, and uh, well, then we, we moved them to teams and they, okay, we bundled the teams and uh, this also made uh, the architecture evolve into more like a modernized uh, design. And this is also a chapter where I talk about uh, team size. So, so how big uh, should a team be? And uh, this is also a very complicated topic, I think, because also if you look at the Scrum Guide, right, it changes every few years. What is the optimal size of a team? Because it highly depends on, uh, on a lot of things. So, so uh, how many roles, how many cross-functional roles do you have in the team? Um, the entire environment. So it's not so easy. I think there's not the one answer to say, okay, six is a perfect team. So um, I try to explain here a, a little bit so that people understand, okay, how do you figure out when your team is too small and how to figure out when it is too big, uh, when do we have too much communication overhead and when do we not have the, the necessary uh, positive synergy that comes from a, from a bigger team. Um, yeah, because this helps you then structure your teams and this will influence your software architecture. So of course I, I talk a little bit about event-driven architecture, but it's more here, okay, uh, what can you do from a DevOps perspective to, to um, optimize uh, your teams and your team structures and how the teams work together um, to uh, achieve a better software quality. And this also means aligning, um, aligning the, the frequency of, of sprints, of quarters, or whatever you have, because not all teams work the same, and especially in big companies, uh, some might be much faster, some might be slower, but you cannot have like a, a, a pace that works against each other, because you have dependencies, people still have to, uh, to talk and need some alignments, so, so you, you need to align these frequencies, so, so you can have teams that work faster and they have, I don't know, one week sprints, uh, but at the end, uh, then, then the others must be a uh, multiple of that, right? So it still must fit in the same bigger cycles uh, that the company uses. Yep, so that's part four. Then part five is uh, about lean product management. So this is more focusing on, on what people build. And um, I know, um, yeah, some some other DevOps, also books and consultants, they start with the value streams, and then when they they pick already uh, the pilot teams here, they already uh, go for value stream optimization. But I I always think my customers they know what they're doing, right? So they they're building the right stuff because they're they're somehow successful. It's just they they want to change the way how they build it, and of course at the end you also have to look okay, let's optimize what you're building. But I think starting with this at the beginning is too much moving moving parts. So I start to, to uh, I prefer to start uh, simple with just okay, how do you uh, manage your work, lean management, and optimize this, and later look at okay, what are you building, and how can we optimize here your product management? Okay, how do you build uh, good MVPs and not doing POCs, or yeah, um, for example. And uh, yeah, so in this chapter, I also talk about the chasm, early adopters, uh, majority, uh, how do you manage an enterprise portfolio? So if you have more, more than one teams and more than one products, how do you, do you manage them? How do you invest um, here? And uh, yeah, and chapter 19 is then, I would say, the, the end goal where you want to come. How do you... Uh, do experimentation? How do you scientifically prove that what you are building uh, brings the expected value? And how do you have a control group and the yeah, experimental group? How do you define variables and do data-driven um, A-B testing? And uh, yeah, I have some tools here. And uh, I think this is the, the, the high-end high goal, but you need a lot of DevOps maturity. So that, that's why it's basically this the last chapter of, of, the, of the technical part of the book. 
So you have to build up all the strength, you have to shift left, right, uh, release fast in small batches, build the right things and have the right teams and, and then you can start um, yeah, performing um, experimentation or hypothesis driven development. Most of my partner, my customers are not there again. So, um, yeah, so that's that's the, the storyline over the five first parts. Then part six, GitHub on your enterprise is more uh, the, the chapter where I put everything that normally comes at the beginning of the book, right? So hosting options for, for, for GitHub, um, how would you structure teams, authentication, uh, pricing, um, how do you migrate uh, to the platform from other platforms? Should you prefer a high fidelity migration, low fidelity migration? So this is more the, the things, okay, you will need it. You, you want to read about it in the book, uh, but it's not, not so, so important for the transformational part. Um, yeah, organized teams, division parts, um, how many organizations should you have? More, more the practical things in, in, in GitHub. I think that's one uh, chapter in this part uh, that stands a little bit out. This is chapter 23, um, where I sum up a, a little bit the, the story from the book. I have a lot of references to chapter one again, because this is now, okay, how do you transform your enterprise? And, and, and uh, it explains a little bit also how the book is structured uh, this way, right? So if you want to transform your enterprise, why do transformations fail? um and, and and how can you ensure that it's not failing so start with a why give it a good um a, a good reason and, and establish some sense of urgency in your teams that you have to transform um look at the theory of constraints and and uh, only optimize uh, if you really have data that you know this is a bottleneck right find bottlenecks um exploit them synchronize uh, then then get better and then then repeat uh, and do not optimize something just to optimize it so so you know, i find the data first uh, then you can see where the bottleneck is and then uh, try to optimize it and then look at the data if it's really doing something because often people uh, yeah try to uh, just uh, do something because other people do it and it's not even helping because it's not their bottleneck yeah, so uh, yeah, that sums it up. Um, okay, uh, complete uh, transformation, DevOps transformation for your enterprise. Start with a vision, start with a why, uh, make some tooling decisions because I think tooling is the fundamental uh, part here that, that, that will drive it. So even if, if the, right, it's 5% uh, about tools, I think I, I might cite uh, Willie here. Uh, DevOps is about 80% uh, uh, people, 15% uh, uh, processes, and only 5% tools. But still, uh, as we're developers, tools have an important role. Define the matrix, uh, then people process culture, build pilot teams one after the other, start restructuring it, find all the obstacles, and, and uh, get the obstacles out of the way, and then you can uh, scale DevOps in your organization. And don't forget the adoption change and communication, because this is the important part, because it's about humans, it's about the people and uh, everyone involved. Um, yeah, so that's uh, the the storyline behind the book and, and why it's structured like this. And um, I'm still quite happy um, uh, because it's telling a story, right? So in my first book, it was different. And this time I really think, okay, I have a story uh, that I'm telling. And uh, so far the, the, the reviews are good um, and I'm still yeah pretty happy. So um, what, yeah, what have I learned writing the book? So, um, I think it's important to, to find uh, the story that you want to tell. Do not just write a book about something because you want to write about something. Find the story behind it. Um, also find the audience you want to address because I, 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 with this book, I wanted to address a more advanced audience. And, and if you then talk to your editor, if you talk to your technical reviewers, it's easier if you say, uh, if they ask, oh, does your audience know it? You can say, yes, because it's for more advanced people, right? So having a clear idea for whom the book is also really helps when uh, authoring it. Um, finding a pace that works. Uh, this is also a, a question I normally get a lot. Is okay, how did you manage to, to write a book with all the work and, and behind? And uh, I planned it with uh, one page per day. So uh, it was like seven pages a week. 
So if I could not write my book from Monday to Friday, I, I would I, I knew I had to write seven pages the weekend. And then I would do this because I just had a, had a tight plan and I was delivering like one chapter after the other uh, with a very tight uh, plan. And uh, this really helps keeping the pace. And so, so of course, you normally try to write one page uh, a day, it's sometimes not happening. Then at Saturday, you know, okay, Saturday morning, you sit there a few hours and you start uh, writing. And sometimes you're a little bit behind. Sometimes you, you have some time, then you write a little bit before, but uh, it helps keeping the pace and, and uh, yeah, coming in the practice to doing this uh, regularly. Yeah. So, and also I found that uh, here Pact helped me with like, uh, with the marketing here and then having like some, okay, Mark, give us some names, some influencers, we will write them, we'll ask them to, to read the book and write a review. So this also helped to, to have like a, a good introduction when the book came out and it's not like silently and nobody knows. And uh, yeah, so I think that's the story. And I'm uh, happy to, to answer any questions you have. Fantastic. The, it's, as someone mentioned in the in the chat, this book is way bigger than just GitHub. It covers a lot of material. And yeah, I'm really impressed with this. Uh, as a matter of fact, you, you just convinced me and I bought the book. <laughs> so, um, but I, I've got a question. Um, and um, I, I noticed in the book, you've got some references that are very specific to quality. Well, there are screenshots and also you've got, you refer to certain pricing tiers and so on. How do you ensure, or I don't know if you can ensure, but that the book remains relevant while the product changes? Well, I think uh, the structure of the book is, is not about GitHub at all, right? So it's uh, very much about the DevOps principles. So I, I think it, it, it stays, uh, this part will stay valid for, for many years. And then probably the, the more uh, technical part with the screenshots, I will have to update. The most um, fluent parts, I would say, for example, feature flex frameworks, right? So I, I talk about feature flex framework, and I'm like, oh, should I put launch darkly in here or not and unleash? And I said, okay, I'm going to do this in Markdown. So there's a GitHub repo and uh, it's free and open source. Yeah, I can find it in my user profile. It's called Accelerate DevOps. And uh, it contains, for example, all the hands-ons, right? Hands-on deploying to cloud, uh, to AWS, to Google uh, and, and everything. I just made it in Markdown. So I have some screenshots. I'm explaining some uh, backgrounds here in the book, but I'm more say, okay, this is the companion repo, go out there because it will just uh, make it much easier for me to maintain it. Yeah, that's very clever actually to, to uh, combine the book with a GitHub actually. <laughs> 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 Great, thank you. We've got several yeah. questions, I think. Uh, I don't know, Willie or Shai, do you want to read them? I see one question from Billy, uh, so I'll let Billy ask it. Yes, yeah, so I'll ask the first one, then Shai, you can take over. So, Mike, how did you maintain your motivation? And you've already answered the second part of the question and the pace of, of when writing your book, but it's the motivation because it's a slog. How did you maintain that? Um, I mean, I don't know. I think it's if you if you if you're a runner and you go running every day, you you don't need a bigger motivation, right? Because it just becomes a habit. So I think if you if you start writing regularly, it becomes a habit. So. Um, you still need the motivation, right? Also, as a runner, you, you need mm. some, some basic motivation to start. But once you get in, into the habit of doing it, you're not questioning it, it uh, all the time. So um, I think it, uh, for overall, I, I mean, I didn't want to write a book again. Uh, so I really was skeptical. Uh, right? <laughs> um, but then I, I like the story. And, and this really mm. helped me helped me get into it. Because um, when I found this so at the beginning, it was like, yeah, GitHub. And I wanted to do GitHub because it was like, yeah, GitHub. But then uh, finding the story and say, OK, uh, let, let's write a transformational book and everything. This, this motivated me a lot to get going. But I think uh, once you have this motivation, then it's uh, important to get into the habit, right? Uh, make it to a, a daily or weekly or whatever your pace is, but find the pace uh, and start practicing it and, and try to keep the pace. And it's like if you're, if you're doing sport and you, you're on, on vacation three weeks, then you know if you come back, okay, I have to get back into the habit. And if I, if I will not manage to do this the first days, it, it gets harder and harder. Um, so yeah, it's, it's the same with writing a book. If you're on one of the holidays, three weeks, uh, you will probably not write in that time, but uh, you know, 
afterwards, if you come back, you have to write more even to, to make up for the three weeks. And, and you also make sure to get into the habit again to, to keep up the pace. I've got a follow-up question on this one. Are you using any specific routine to get into that habit? Like, for example, is the same period of time uh, um, uh, at a day, uh, or you've got specific type of cup of coffee that actually inspires you or, or gets you actually in the in the mood? No, no. Um, so um, specific time is difficult if you have a job, a full time job. Uh, so I, I would have reserved like a Saturday and, and, and Sunday for, OK, you could not make it in the week. Then uh, Saturday morning, uh, I would just start writing. And normally at, at midday, I would take a break and then uh, sometimes in the evening do some one or two hours again. Um, but uh, no. But the thing is, if you're if you're in the practice of, of doing it, uh, you think a lot about the book on other times, right? So, so it's something in your head because you know, right now I'm, I'm writing this chapter. So you think about it, you read about it. And, and so it's not just, it's not, not writing, right? It's not, uh, it's, like, it's like coding, you're not typing, you're, you're, you're thinking something. And so, so even if I would write it on, on Saturday, uh, the entire week, I, I would still research uh, from time to time, look up things uh, and take some screenshots and already think out in my mind what, what I would write then on Saturday. Or sometimes I would, would already write a little bit uh, if I have time. But uh, yeah, I think it's, 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 it's more the general. So you know what you're working on. You have this chapter. You have this many weeks to do it, and and, uh, and then 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 you automatically keep the pace. Also, if you have like a very very strict plan, it's okay. This is the chapter. This is where you want to deliver. This is where your your free technical reviewers will review it, and you also have a little bit more pressure. So even if the world will not uh, fall apart if you would not deliver, but still, it's a, a commitment. That's truly inspiring. And uh, I must admit, I have already added your book to the 2023 uh, books to read list. Uh, I see that uh, some other colleagues of mine are also echoing a similar sentiment. Uh, you're definitely getting a lot of uh, readers from this community here. Jason is asking, uh, in your experience, what is the biggest roadblock companies that have companies have with implementing DevOps and how do they successfully overcome those challenges? So the biggest roadblock for me is uh, thinking that you're special, right? And especially my customers in Germany. So every customer I go to is, uh, yeah, we cannot do this because we are so special. And uh, the truth is you're not, right? You're just another company and, uh, oh, you, you're building machines that can kill people. Yeah, but every machine can kill people. Cars can kill people, planes can kill. So they have all the same problems. So, so you're probably not special. Yeah, we are financial, we work with, yes, yes, but you're not special. So first is you have to realize you're not so special than you think. And this is not, not bad because you can learn from other people, right? And uh, I think the second thing is, um, what's it called, velocity? Um, so, so um, you have to establish some search of urgency. So uh, if, if you don't have urgency, people don't want to change. And, and, and we're talking about uh, transformation, right? So you have to, to uh, transform your enterprise and transform the people. And, and uh, people won't change, but people don't want to change. So um, you have to establish this, this urgency, this vision uh, that say, okay, we, we need to change. If not, we will be out of business or, or whatever it is, right? Or also quality. And it can also be, okay, we, we enhance the, the, the life of, of the developers here. But you have to establish the urgency. Uh, if not, people will pretend doing something and they will intend it a little bit, but uh, then it will just like, nah, it's no. And then they, because people are in habits and then they, they will just continue uh, doing what they ever did and uh, maybe renaming uh, some roles and uh, it's the same with the agile transformation right so now we have project managers that are named scrum masters but still the people work the old way if they did not have the the urgency uh, really to transform and uh, yeah give up old habits and uh, build up new ones Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for that, Mike. Uh, before I hand it over to Martin here, uh, another quick question. Uh, I, I saw this somewhere. Uh, where was this kite surfing uh, picture taken? It's a really beautiful picture. That's here in, uh, in, in South Spain, in Marbella. Yeah. Thank you. Martin, over to you. I think you're muted. Oh, there we go. 
Sorry, I had it on my head. <laughs> uh, there's so much detail in, in this book, and I was kind of blown away uh, by each, each and every subsequent level of detail. Um, when you were writing this, how did you know when to stop the research and, and say, okay, now this is enough. Uh, I've got enough for this chapter. And, you know, it seems like you kept on going and then, okay, well, maybe another chapter and another one. And like, how did you draw the line to say, okay, now it's that, that's where I'm, that's where I'm going to draw. That's where I'm stopping. Oof, that's a difficult question. Um, so uh, when I read the book from Eric Evans, um, uh, I was really impressed about the ability to, to do something very theoretical. And uh, you think, oh, okay, domain-driven design, very, very, right? we talk about domain and here and aggregates, and then he had a code example. So uh, this really um, uh, getting from, from theory to practice and, and building this, this, uh, the, this gap, uh, uh, this is what really inspired me. And this is what I, I try here in the book, right? I, I try to explain the why and then, then, then bring the practical part. So um, the why here is always focused on, on the practical part. So, so I always thought about this first. Does this make sense? So, so um, um, right, if you know what, what you want to explain or what I would do with my teams, if I work with a customer and say, okay, now let's, let's look at your trunk based development. What's your workflow, how you work here. Then I would uh, think, okay, what theory would I need? And then this would already right, give the scope. And, uh, of course, I mean, uh, with uh, research papers, you can always go deeper and deeper, but it's normally not necessary here to explain the points I want to make for, for, for the practical part. I think this <clears throat> this helps because if not, you will just get it's not it's not a research I'm, I'm doing here. Right? It's it's I'm, I'm taking the research and I, I'm bringing it uh, and explaining how you can apply it practically. So uh, that I think always gives gives the scope. Yeah, and my my second question is kind of really related to that, and it's like how did you how did you find the story to tell? So at the beginning, you you you, you had struggled a bit with with, with you know, not wanting to make it a technical journal and, you know, finding some sort of way to roll it out, something to make it into a story. But how did you find that? Uh, how did you, you know, find, discover that? Well, it, uh, it was really thing to my talk editor about. that challenged me. And he was like, really, he was like, oh, my, nobody wants to read this. And uh, if, if you just came up with a with the outline and you're really proud of, right? Because I did it. Rah, 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 and then, then they said, oh my God, nobody wants to read this. It really makes me all oh, shit. And, and he was right, of course. But uh, I think getting this feedback um, really helped me to, to rethink everything. Okay. And then and, and this also, um, the dialogue with someone that is not from the DevOps space, but uh, is interested in writing a book, being the editor for it. And uh, I had to explain him already a lot of things. And, and that's how I came up with the, with the uh, example with kite surfing. Right? I, I was explaining him uh, about DevOps and he, he was asking the stupid questions and intentionally, and, and he did a good job in doing it. And then so he had me explain the story and, and that's how I, I came up with it, I think. So Interesting. Think, yeah, so, find find so, someone that challenges you, and yeah, uh, kind of like your muse, uh, kind of like poking <laughs> at you. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And also, what I'm hearing is some self-inflicted pressure is always good. Uh, you know, uh, many people can get caught up in the perfection of things. I mean, Martin, that's what I was getting from your question. And, yeah, totally. you know, I'm I'm not a stranger to that either. Like, I keep tinkering and tinkering and you know, but from uh, what I'm hearing from Mike, it's like about those self-imposed uh, deadlines and having the discipline to stick to it, like uh, doing a presentation at 4 a.m. in a different continent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also the process, having the process here, right? So the process where I would finish uh, the draft mm. and the draft goes to an editor and then it goes to the technical review and I read technical reviewers and then it would come back to me with feedback and then I would finish it and it would go to the proofreading. And just having this process and following the process, this really helps in, in, in because you're just writing a draft, right? You can still, uh, so you don't need the 100%. And also I'm, I'm not a native speaker, so I'm, I'm 
probably struggling a little bit with the language, but you just also trust the process. People will later uh, ho hopefully fix this. And you have your technical reviewers that give you feedback. And so uh, you're writing drafts. And basically then the process uh, makes uh, that this trust evolve to, to the final product. And uh, yeah, it's like, like in software development, right? You have to find a process with small iterations and then uh, it helps you uh, Keep the yeah, I, I like the concept, or not, not really a concept, but the way you kept on referring to it as a draft, you know, that, <laughs> that, 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 that allows you to let go. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's your first draft. Yeah, yeah. First draft, and then you get your feedback from your editor and then adjust it a little bit and then uh, go so edit. Uh, have, yeah, the process helped me. And it, it was yeah. something I learned on the second book because I did not have this in the first one. Right? In the first book, I just wrote the first two chapters and uh, they was like, yeah, fine. And then I did everything on my own. So having this, this tight schedule and having this process and, and knowing what steps comes after the other, this really also helped me uh, this time to do this uh, in, in a constant and, and not just in a lucky lockdown uh, where you suddenly have a lot of tweaks at <laughs> free time. So I, I gather your editor then brought the process to you? Yes. yes. Very cool. We need to have that. I saw this question in the uh, chat that I almost missed. Apologies, Owen. Uh, so what are the best GitHub features that that are most underappreciated or underutilized, according to Mike? Oof. Um, that's difficult. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's now a lot of hype around uh, code spaces and uh, co-pilot and so on, but I think, well, for me, uh, GitHub Actions is, I mean, it's not, un, I mean, a lot of people use it, but I, I think the power that comes with Actions from automation, it says it, it's not just CI, CD, right? That you can really automate anything. You have a webhook for anything. You have the API and you can do anything in GitHub. So, uh, and I think uh, people could do a lot more with it. Um, also, what I think that people underestimate is uh, GitHub sponsors and what GitHub is doing here in the open source world in general with also his funding. They have now a 10 million fund uh, to, to, to give open source developers the chance to, to make a living out, out of coding. So I think uh, th this will be a big ecosystem in the future, right? So, so people can really have a career there. So you, you start with your pet projects and, and it's not like funding a company. You just start with a pet project, but if it gets bigger and bigger, you can make a living out of it and then create a company around it. So it's like also a, a startup hub for the future, I think open source. So it, this, this is also something I think there will be a lot more traction over the years because people are not realizing yet how important open source will be in the future. Owen, uh, please feel free to go off of mute. I see you had a couple more questions. Sure, thanks for the answer there, Mike. Uh, that was really informative. Um, so one thing I, I just wanna um, verify my understanding, uh, um, but it sounds like what you're saying is that one of the theses, the key thesis of the book is that GitHub and DevOps are tools to achieve an agile transformation. Um, and if so, if that's accurate, uh, I'm curious about like in what key ways you see uh, that tool and technique uh, as achieving that based on, I'm assuming that you're drawing from your uh, your consulting experience. So uh, so I'm, I'm interested to hear some specific stories. Um, so, so GitHub is not necessary to do DevOps, right? So uh, it's just here in my case, I just picked it as the tool to go. So you can do the same thing with Azure DevOps and probably with GitLab. Um, so it's, it's not about the tool here. It's about, okay, the, the way of working. But um, what I experience when I go to customers is that they normally have this huge tool chain uh, with best of breed here and there and, and the big company Jira um, that they had from their Scrum transformation many years ago that is now all, all, again blown up as this big management tool that people hate. And uh, so for a transformation, having a new platform where people can go to so that you can let go of these old processes and just migrate over what you need um, 
uh, often helps, right? If you just want to do everything in place, you know, say, okay, where's your code? Okay, this is here. What are your pipeline? Okay, this is the Jenkins. And then this is here and, and your things are in Jira. Then you have all this ballast that you want to get rid of uh, when it comes to lean management. So having a new platform, I, I think helps, or at least uh, aligning or removing something. And, and, um, and, and so this, I just picked GitHub here because um, it's, uh, yeah. Fancy, it's new. <laughs> it's uh, it's growing fast, and and I think it's a good tool. It's a good platform uh, with the new capabilities to it, and uh, yeah. But you can achieve the same. So it's not uh, it's not tools first, but it's people first, processes first, and then then the tools uh, last. And um, I think nice here is if I talk about GitHub, and GitHub is like the home of open source. It's also a reason why I, I introduce a lot of open source tools in the book and then point to them, right? So uh, feature flags, unleash, and here, and so often referred to open source projects because they live on, on GitHub and you have this tight integration and also from a security perspective uh, with the security advisories that helps you in your software supply chain. So that makes uh, GitHub a good choice, I think, but uh, also, I was thinking about maybe adding a second edition of the book for another platform. I think that would be valid, right? You just have to, to rethink, okay, this is the theory part. Okay, how would I do it practically on another platform and apply the same principles? It would still work. Did you receive any support from Microsoft with, uh, with this project? Um, well, so uh, two of my technical reviewers, one is from GitHub, one from Microsoft, one is an independent, uh, also MVP. Um, but of course, it was not from Microsoft. So it's, it's uh, they, they just happened to work there and uh, they were found by, by me or by my editor independently. So really support? No, no. And until now, I also didn't really receive a marketing. Uh, uh, so, so, so I was hoping and GitHub said, you know, it's logical and yes, we do it. But until now, I, I did not even have a shout out from the GitHub uh, Twitter handle or something that, uh, that the book exists. So, so far, not really a support, I would say. I was hoping for more. But... Did I hear you hinting, Mike, that there's going to be a sequel? With a different uh, platform? No, I would. I'm, I'm really just using GitHub for the last years, and uh, I still have Azure DevOps customers, and uh, I work with them. But every time I'm a little bit struggling, so oh, where was it? And and I, I really uh, so uh, I now now all edges of GitHub. So this would be if I find someone that says, hey, let's do this together, and uh, I want to do the, the help with the practical part. Um, but I'm not, not not actively planning it. I had some colleagues that, that had the idea and then I'm, I'm pretty open to it if they, they would uh, contribute a lot to it. <laughs> uh, but it's not, not a real plan right now. Thank you. Uh, I did scan through all of the questions. I believe we've gone through all the questions that have been uh, posted. Uh, others uh, in the group, please feel free to go off of mute and ask uh, Mike any questions if you have any. So the, the book is now cheaper, just maybe as a last note. Um, um, Pakpone provide me with a discount code, uh, but they struggle with their website. So they probably did not read the book. They should read it to figure out uh, fixing the website sooner and not in three months. Uh, so um, I, I do not have a nice discount code for you, um, but the book is uh, this month 20% uh, cheaper. So it will go up uh, um, again, probably next month. So just uh, this is like a discount code, but you can order also the print copy on Amazon now cheaper uh, around the globe. And also the Kindle version and the, the print version are, are $10, $10 cheaper, I think. But, and you know. Just in time for Christmas presents for all your favorite technologists. It, it was for GitHub Universe, actually. <laughs> I had reduced for GitHub Universe, but it was late. I did not make it in time. I didn't get out a shout out from the GitHub handle anyway, so it uh, doesn't matter. But it's, it's still, uh, yeah. It takes some time for Amazon to, to process these uh, pricing changes. Uh, so it took, took some time to go down. It probably takes some time again to go up. But uh, yeah, probably next next month uh, they will uh, yeah, increase it again. Well, if they're like the gas companies, they'll go up a lot faster than they'll go down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, Billy, Andre, any comments in closing? No, I would say uh, uh, Scott already left, but uh, many thanks, uh, Michael, for 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 this. This was really very interesting. Both presentations were, were extremely interesting uh, from my perspective. So thank you very much for for this. Uh, thank you very much also to Ilse, Shai, and Willy for helping with organizing this event. Um, and also thank you to all the participants. Um, as a matter of fact, if as always, if you have some topic that you'd like to talk to, for example, you know, please reach out to us and we are always uh, looking for new interesting uh, people that would like to share something about the DevOps and what they do, their experiences. So thank you very much for this. And Mike, it is, yeah, it was really very inspiring. I think many of us want to write books uh, and many of us actually stop at a certain point because we are too busy. But, um, you know, carving this time, being motivated and, and I think the, the the biggest thing that I got from this one is actually find your story because the, your story is going to motivate you and keep you keep you engaged. I think that's the most important thing uh, to 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 actually write the book. So thank you very much for sharing. Thank you for having me. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone, and have a great night or great day, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have a good morning. <laughs> I, I go to sleep again a few hours. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you, bye -bye. everyone. Thanks, guys. It was awesome. Thank you. Thanks, all.